thank you. It's a great pleasure um, to uh, be uh, with uh, you guys. I, uh, I, um, yeah. So I, uh, I was mentioning before. I've been very impressed by the website of Interstem. You guys seem to be a very nice organization. Okay, and so perhaps so you are all in uh, high school students and. Um, I think that uh, we uh, are going to consider this an in, as an introduction to college in the sense that uh, um, currently in high school, I think most of your teachers can speak English, whereas in college, you know, they are all going to speak, in, in particular in the science and engineering classes, they tend to speak uh, uh, with a strange accent like my accent like my French accent. I think that last time you had a German accent and I don't know uh, next time. And so I grew up in France. I've been in Los Angeles for 35 years teaching at USC. Um, so I grew up in France, uh, in the south of France, in the Pyrenees, so for instance, the nice view behind me is actually taken from the family house in the Pyrenees Mountains. That's uh, from the house where my father was born. Okay, so I'm going to talk about uh, something and the, the main theme of the talk will be how uh, we can use techniques from relatively pure mathematics, like the ones designed to, uh, to study objects like this. Typically, this is a picture you would see in a calculus class. And then to analyze objects like this, well, what this represents is something called the backbone of the internet. Namely, something uh, which doesn't look like this, right? Okay. So, and uh, the idea behind that is the idea of curvature. So, uh, the curvature measures how much something is curved. So, let's start first with a curve. And if we want to know how curved it is, so that's a curve, like, uh, you know, uh, it's a, a doodle. And then how much does it turn? Eh? That's what the curvature measures, how you turn. Well, uh, so the, the curvature at a given point, like here, it's a number and it measures how much the curve is turning there. Okay. so. This is mathematics. There is a formula which you don't, which I'm throwing in your face, but you don't need to understand what that is. Huh? Just um, it's something which we know well. We take derivative. So if you, if uh, some of you guys are taking calculus, these are deriv derivatives and second derivatives, blah 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 blah. But it's a horrible formula which computes the curvature at every point. Okay? So, but intuitively, if I take a straight line, the curvature measures how much a straight line is turning. How much is that? Zero, yes. Yeah. So the curvature is zero, yes. Uh, the curvature of a circle of radius R, well, that's a little more tricky, but there is a formula so we can compute it. And it turns out that it's one over the radius. Okay, that's not, um, that's a computation. And, but actually that explains, uh, that explains a word that you may have heard before, which is for a curve, you have something called the radius of curvature. And based on this formula, you just solve for the radius in terms of the curvature. So the radius of curvature is one over the curvature. Uh, that's another name for that. Yeah, so, uh, I mean, you, you can hear that for a, a road or something like that. Okay. So that's mathematics. Mathematics, you have a formula and, um, uh, um, and uh, you want to be able to compute. But you guys, you're not just math nerds. I, I see that you're also science nerds and, uh, and you, probably, you may want to be engineering nerds. Right? And in this case, it's not a formula you want. You want to be able to do measurements. And there are also tools to measure the curvature of a curve. And so I happen to own one, and it looks like this. Eh? So the, the way to understand the curvature is that you are going to pretend that you drive on the curve, 
and then the and then the curvature measures how much you're supposed to turn the steering wheel. Okay? So that's why I own one of those. Um, it's not completely the same brand. I don't know if you can see what uh, this one is. It's a Ferrari. Yeah? So I don't, uh, my, car, uh, my car is a beaten up uh, Honda Civic. Okay. And, but also if you think about the, if you think about the example of the car, uh, there is the fact that you know that you can turn right or you can turn left. And if you're driving, that makes a big difference. And so uh, in this case, we actually consider what's called the sign, the curvature, and we, we put a sign in front where, and the convention is that we put a plus if you turn left and you put a minus if you turn right. right? Okay, that's the convention. Um, don't see any politics there. Um, okay, so that's for a curve. But now let's go to something uh, more complicated than the simple, uh, simple doodle on the screen like this. And let's consider a surface. Okay, so which kind of surface? Well, let's think, let's take an example, which is a mountain like this. Uh, so this is, um, uh, this is a mountain in Southern California. Actually, it's on uh, one of the trails going to Mount Baldy uh, behind Los Angeles. Uh, and so that's something you could be interested in. And uh, the, the mathematical version, that would be this. And I want to know, so you see, this is a surface. And I want to know how much it's curved. And so for instance, let's say here you have the mountain pass here. I mean, you remember that. So when you have a mountain, you have the top of the mountain, but also you have a mountain pass here. And so let's go to the mountain pass here. And I want to know how much it's, uh, the, the, um, how much this surface is curved. Clearly it's not flat, it's a mountain, right? And so it has uh, some curvature. So let's try to see how we can do that. And so the trick is that you consider a plane which goes uh, through the point I'm sitting at and uh, that is orthogonal or perpendicular to the surface. Like in this case, because it's the mountain pass, it would be vertical. Okay, and then I see how it cuts the surface. So the picture is roughly what you see on the right here. Hey, the, the mountain is here. And so it's like, uh, because I cut that way, it's like sort of flat here, huh? not much curvature. But then if I turn, ah, you see that now it begins to be like this. So now you begin to see a little bit of curvature. And if I turn more, I see even more curvature. And so what I'm going to do is that I'm going to consider the curvature of the curve like this, then I measure how much it turns. And exactly like uh, I would uh, consider the curvature to be positive when I turn to the right and negative when I, um, the other way around. It's positive when I turn to the left and negative when I turn to the right. We can do the same thing here. And uh, it's going to be, um, and so in this case, well, in this case, I can tell you really well, very well. So the, the subtle point is here. Eh? And I can tell, I cannot tell very well whether it's a, a turning. A, so, so here I'm going to count it positive when you move away, when you turn away from the mountain. Here I cannot tell quite very well, but here clearly I'm moving away from the mountain. So here the curvature is positive and I keep going, it's positive. And then when I keep going uh, farther, you see it starts going down a little bit. So that means that the curvature is decreasing. So I had the maximum here for the curvature and that maximum was positive. And then I keep turning my plane and you see what's happening on the, on the left. And my curve here looks like this and then it starts curving towards the mountain, even more towards the mountain. 
even more. So it's becoming even more negative. Ne Oops, negative, and here it's really the maximum. And then I keep, uh, I keep doing, but also, and then I keep doing it. And then now it starts going back up, back up, back up. And then, up, I go back to where I was. I mean, that's, uh, the, the, that was the starting point. Okay, so, so, so here was what we saw. I had my plane, I turned it around. And if I look at the intersection, if I look at how it cuts the surface, I had the picture which was sort of flat. He went up like this and then, and, sorry, he went up like this until the curvature reached a positive maximum. And then it started going down again, down again, and then became very much negative. I was minimum, and then I went back to where I started. Okay, so let's do the same thing at the top of the mountain. So I get the plane, and then I'm going to turn it. So here you see it's curving towards the mountain, towards the, the bottom. So the curvature is negative. And then I keep going, I keep turning. Still negative, still negative. Uh, and actually uh, you can check that uh, it's, um, it's, uh, it's, it's negative, but it's uh, very close to zero and then you keep going down and then you're curving more and more in the negative way until you hit that position where the curvature is still negative and it reaches a minimum and then, and then you go back up and you go back to where you started essentially. Okay, and so the question is, uh, so, so let, let, let me go through the movie again. Uh, I went, up, I had the minimum of the curvature, and then whoop, I had the maximum of the curvature. And so the curvature was somewhere in between. And in the previous case, I also had a minimum and a maximum, but in one case, the maximum was positive and then the minimum was negative. Whereas in the, the other case, the maximum and the minimum were both negative. So the curvature is always between these two numbers. And so which one should I take? Uh, let's, nope. Which one should I take? The maximum or the minimum mm, for the curvature? Well, when you hesitate, when you, what you're supposed to do, you're supposed to take the average. Eh? So you split the difference if you want. Uh, but the thing is that in mathematics, there are two types of averages. One is what we call the arithmetic mean. Well, this is just the stupid average. Right? So you have these two numbers, the maximum and the minimum. You take the sum and you divide by two. Or, or you could take what uh, in mathematics is called the geometric mean and then we, you take the product. Actually, to get the geometric mean, what you take is the square root of the product, but oops, uh, the square root of the product. But here I just take the product and that has a name, that's the Gauss curvature. Uh, Gauss named after the famous uh, mathematician, physicist, and uh, genius of all type, Gauss. Uh, in the early 19th century. Okay, so let's try to uh, let's try to uh, understand this. If I take a plane, a plane is pretty flat. Clearly, there is no curvature anywhere. The maximum and the minimum curvature is zero. So if I take the average, I take I find zero. If I take the product, I find zero. So that's a little boring. At a mountain top here, like here or there, we saw that the maximum and the minimum are both negative. And so if I take the sum and I divide by two, I get a negative number. But if I take the product, I get, uh, if I take the product of two negative numbers, I get a positive number. So this 
Gauss curvature here is positive. And then at a mountain pass, the maximum and the minimum are uh, the maximum is positive and the minimum is negative. And so the product, the Gauss curvature, is going to be negative. And uh, uh, the mean curvature, I cannot tell because it depends when I take the sum of a positive number with a negative number. Sometimes I get something positive, sometimes I get something negative. So let's see if you get that. If I'm at the bottom of a lake, what do you think these, what can I say about this mean curvature here and this Gauss curvature? Or more precisely, what can I say about the k-mean, the maximum and the minimum of the curvature? So at the bottom of a lake, the, uh, the surface, it's curving in all possible directions. Is it curving uh, away from the mountain or towards the mountain? What do you think? Hmm. Eh? I, think it would go, I think it would go um, towards the mountain or no, away from the mountain. Away, obviously you're turning away, you're turning up, up that's away from the mountain. Eh? Mm -hmm. And it doesn't matter really of the direction. So the maximum and the minimum are both positive so when I take the sum, yeah, so the maximum and the minimum are both positive. And so when I take the sum, I get a positive number. And when I take the product, I also get a positive number. Okay. So this is the basic thing. So it's more complicated to understand the curvature of a surface. And so, uh, ah, so, but this is mathematics. There should be formulas. So I'm going to show you the formula and I'm going to ask you to memorize them. Okay, are you ready? Okay, so you memorize that formula because we're going to need them for the rest of the talk. Right? So that's, that's really important. Obviously I'm kidding, right? Um, yeah, there is, no way, uh, you, there is no way you can memorize this formula and even sort of understand what they are. Huh? But um, okay, there is, uh, there is a formula we can, that can be computed, eh? okay? That's just what I want you to get out of this. So that's when you do mathematics. Now, if you do physics or whatever, why should you care? So in particular, I have this mean curvature and this Gauss curvature. And so let's take the mean curvature, which was, if you remember, that was the sum of the maximum and minimum divided by two. Well, that comes up in a, a very simple physical uh, question, which is the following. Let's take a, a piece of wire like this. This is a completely random piece of wire and you dip it in soapy water. And then, you, eh? and then what you know is that you get a soap film going around that. And then of course, uh, what you know is that if you blow, you could you get bubbles, right? Eh? You've done that before. Eh? So, but before you blow, what's the shape of the film? So you see it's here. And what you see very well on that picture is that it looks like a uh, mountain uh, pass hmm? Be uh, where there is one direction where clearly the curvature goes in that direction. And on the other hand, in this direction. So in this way, the curvature goes up. And if you go around there, the direction goes down. And so it's one of those cases where you have a little bit of curvature and a little bit of uh, in one direction and a little bit of curvature in the other direction. You're taking the sum. And I told you that uh, you, you could not predict what the sum would look like. Here, yes, because the physics of soul films tell us, tells us that you get a surface where the mean curvature is zero everywhere. And so that's the physics of soap uh, films. So, uh, so that's an experiment. Um, you can, instead of taking a bad wire like this 
you can take like a nice circle that you dip in soapy water. And then what you get is a surface of uh, mean curvature zero. Actually, you know what you get in that case. You get a disk, a flat disk. Well, which is, um, so actually you're not surprised because we saw that uh, the mean, for a flat disk, we saw that the mean curvature was zero. But then you can do more interesting things like you take two, um, two circles and uh, you put them very, very close and then you dip them in soapy water. And so you get that very nice cylinder here, but it's curved. And actually this is a nice surface with a name. It's called the catenoid. Okay, and now you could take three circles and then you're going to get this by dipping them in soapy water. Except, except I'm lying here. Because this picture, so all of those pictures are real. These are actual photographs. This one is a computer generated picture. Namely, if you take these three rings, there is indeed a surface whose boundary is made up of these three rings and it looks exactly like this. Eh? And so in theory, you could create a soap film uh, that looks like this. So it's certainly you, that much more interesting than just blowing bubbles. Eh? After this talk, you, you're never going to blow, to, to blow stupid, stupid round bubbles anymore. Eh? You, um, uh, you, uh, but uh, this, um, on the other hand, um, this surface, nobody has been able to create an actual soap film. It's, um, it's too hard physically to do, right? So this is computer generated, but in theory, you could have a soap film like this. By the way, if you blow on, uh, in this case, for instance, if, if you blow, then, so what uh, the effect of blowing is that uh, your, um, the, the pressure of the air on one side when you blow is higher than the pressure on the other side. And actually when you do that, what you're going to get is a, is a film where the mean curvature is not zero everywhere. What it is, is that it's the difference in the pressure of the air. That's what the physics tell you. So actually it's a, it's a very interesting uh, way of seeing the mean curvature in terms of blowing on the soap films. So that's why, for instance, a, if you take a bubble, you know, it's a sphere, it's a round sphere. And the reason is because, uh, well, the sphere is a nice surface of constant mean curvature. Right? So, uh, so, so that's why these, mean people care about this mean curvature. But actually I care more about the, um, I care more about the other one. Uh, yes, except, ah, which, oh, I see what happened. I missed a, uh, okay, yeah, it's fine. Uh, I'm going to care about the Gauss curvature. And I'm going to show you why, why I'm going to care about that one. So the, when you have the Gauss curvature, it's a number. So either it's equal to zero or it's positive like at a mountain top or it's negative like at a, at a mountain pass. But when it's zero, like on the plane, you know that if you take a circle of radius r, you know that the perimeter of that circle is two pi r, right? You know that formula. If you take a, a disk of radius r, its area is pi r square. And you also know that if you take a triangle, the sum of the angles is 180 degrees, okay? When you're at the top of the mountain where the curvature is zero, then this is different. It turns out that, I mean, if you think about it, it's not too uh, difficult to imagine. But, so if, you, if at the top of a mountain, you take a circle of radius r, then the perimeter is less than what you expected. It's, Similarly, the area of a disk is less than you expected. And it's because there is less space. You know, when, you, when you're at the top of the mountain, you feel a little constrained. Um, or 
a physical example, a nice surface of positive curvature is the sphere. And in particular, a nice sphere is the Earth. And if you're on the Earth, uh, if you, so there is the North Pole, and then you have all these parallels, like, uh, uh, you know, here uh, in Los Angeles, we are roughly at, on the, at the 35th degree parallel. Uh, if you go down, you can reach the Tropic of Cancer. And at that uh, place, the length of uh, the, the Tropic of Cancer is a distance approximately 4,500 4, miles from the North Pole. But if you look at its length, it's not 2 pi times 4,500. It's only 22,000 uh, miles, roughly, which is uh, about 20% less than what you would expect. Eh? So the, the distances are shorter in the Earth than on the plane. And conversely, if you're at a mountain pass where the, uh, where the curvature is negative, then the perimeter of the, at a mountain pass, you know, it goes up in one direction and down towards the valley. You have more space there. And so indeed, the perimeter of a circle is bigger than what you would have expected. And the area of the disk is more than what you have expected, namely pi r squared. Okay, and similarly, so that's a little harder to see, but if you take the, if you take a triangle at the top of a mountain, the sum of the angles is not exactly 180 degrees, it's more. And at a mountain pass where the negative curvature is negative, it's less than 180. Okay, so what you can see is the following. So you can think of it in the following way. So if you're in curvature zero, a triangle looks like, it, like this, right? And um, that would be in curvature zero. But when the curvature is positive, the angles are more. So it looks more like that. Namely, triangles are fat. But when the curvature is negative, the triangles are skinny because the angles are smaller than what you would expect. So that's what I would like you to get out of this. And the curvature, the Gauss curvature, it's something defined by a, form, a horrible formula that I flashed on the screen before. And it has the property that when, uh, when it's positive, the triangles are fat. When it's negative, they are skinny like this. Okay, that was geometry. And now uh, that, that was the geometry of surfaces. And now let's go in different worlds. And um, well, so surfaces, you know, curves are objects of dimension one, surfaces are objects of dimension two, and then there exist objects of dimension three, like the world we live in, and then four and five and six and dimension n. And uh, there is a notion of curvature in these spaces. This is a branch of mathematics called Riemannian geometry named after Mr. Riemann, uh, again, someone from the 19th century. And this is widely used in mathematics, but also in physics. So for instance, general relativity or string theory, which are these things you may have heard about, right? they are expressed in terms of Riemannian geometry. Right? So this is the kind of geometry you encounter in physics, but also in engineering. Uh, if you try to fly a plane, so you have all these controls to fly the plane, and uh, usually these are better understood uh, by considering a space of a very large dimension. Okay, but there are other spaces like this one. So that's what we call a graph, namely it consists of dots, you see all those dots, and then they are connected by certain light segments, like you see them everywhere. So people also call that a network. 
and they come up in many uh, contexts, so in mathematics, but also in, uh, uh, in engineering. So in particular, uh, you heard uh, probably about social network. So, so here for me, these are dots, eh? dots and lines. But in a social network, you would have a dot for each person. And then you put a line when they know each other or when they talk to each other. So for instance, interstem, uh, th there is probably an interstem social network, not, not uh, a few members of interstem know each other, but you probably don't know all of, uh, don't know, uh, all of each other. Uh, so that would be an interesting graph. With, uh, and uh, so Facebook is a type of social network. Uh, a terrorist network, that's unfortunately also a social network. So you can see how people may want to study those. Uh, so, and indeed, people who work for Facebook spend a huge amount of time trying to study a graph like this to try to figure out, well, for instance, they probably figure out that there is that group of people somewhere uh, who uh, like uh, um, science, uh, math, and engineering. STEM, that would be you guys. Eh? Uh, so Facebook is really good at identifying nice subgroup in, um, the, in, a big, in a large graph like this. And the way they do it is by actually doing a lot of mathematics to really try to get information from a picture like that. Okay, another example, uh, which is closer to what I'm going to talk about is in engineering, that would be an electrical graph where you have machines that are connected by cables. Eh? That's all. And when I say machines, they could also be just light bulbs and, uh, or whatever. Okay, and so that really doesn't look like a surface, right? Eh? Uh, however, we can still talk about curvature here. So for instance, uh, a special kind of graph is a tree, namely. So what you see in my example here, this graph has a lot of loops, namely uh, closed curves where I start here and I can go back to where I started without ever backtracking. So that would be a loop. Here, I cannot do that because if I start here, I, again, if I ever want to go back where I started, I have to do some backtracking somewhere. Okay? So that's called a tree because it looks like a tree, right? And so, uh, and a tree is neg has negative curvature in the sense I discussed before because if you look at a triangle in a tree, so what's a triangle? You take three dots, like these two red, these three red dots, and then you take the line going from this dot to this dot. Namely, you take the shortest path going, the shortest route to go from this dot to that one. Well, that gives that. And then, so I have three of them like this. That would be the sides of my triangle. And you see, that triangle looks very skinny. Actually, it's a, it looks like a, the letter Y. Eh? Eh? So, uh, so certainly it's very skinny. And uh, so we can, that hints that the curvature should be negative. Actually, it's minus infinity in that case. Similarly, you have graphs which are almost a tree, like, uh, like this, like this one. You know, it has a few loops, but not too many. And so if I take a triangle like uh, this one, for instance, well, it's not that skinny, skinny the way the other one was, but it still looks pretty much like uh, the letter Y, right? I mean, there is like this little bulge here and that little bulge there, but roughly, and uh, roughly it's the same. So. The triangles are, I wrote, somewhat skinny. So of course, uh, here, this is just hand waving. Mathematicians have a way to make this precise, and in particular to say, well, uh, there is a, 
and to say that there is still the features of the negative curvature in a graph like this, and we can make sense of that with precise formulas, which I'm not going to flash in your face this time. Okay, so there is a whole branch of math. There is a whole branch of pure mathematics that deals with objects like that. And it was really developed by this guy, that's Misha Gromov, uh, shown here receiving the Abel Prize in 2009. That's uh, what you get when you get that prize. The Abel Prize is sort of the equivalent of the Nobel Prize in mathematics. Um, you may have, have heard of the Fields Medal in mathematics. The difference between the two is that the Fields Medal only goes to young people. Um, the Abel Prize tends to go to people who look like Gromov here, who's uh, certainly not that young, and uh, like Nobel Prizes. I mean, you know, if you look at the people who get Nobel Prizes, in general, they are not incredibly young. Eh? And so he, he got his uh, Abel Prize for many things, but in particular for developing something called uh, geometry group theory, which uses geometric insights to answer questions in algebra, in symbols or graphs. Eh? So in particular, uh, following his work, he started and then people have gone, uh, have gone beyond that we have a very effective set of tools to work on graphs of negative curvature. And the graph we mathematicians are considering, they are very big, they're actually infinity. They go in all possible directions. Okay, so this is pure mathematics, but you know, when you have a toy, like you have a tool, you figure out, well, what can I use it for? And uh, so I told you, we use, we consider very complicated graphs, so that looks like a graph. Now you cannot see very well. So I, I'm just focusing on one piece. I think it's the piece here eh? in this picture here. Mm. So what's this? Well, you see it's a graph. You have dots. Oops, nope. You have dots. And then uh, you have lines in between. Don't be fooled. The fact that some of... Um, the lines are big is because uh, uh, I'm bigger than others. Uh, it's only because the person who drew the picture needed to have enough space on the sheet of paper. Eh? So it's exactly like uh, uh, the, a picture like this or, or more like this one actually, more like this one, except it's way, way bigger. Uh, I used to know how many nodes, did I write this somewhere? I used to know how many nodes, uh, how many dots there were there. It's, a, it's, it's very big and it's the so-called backbone of the internet. So what's the backbone? Well, you know, when you use the internet, so you have your computer and uh, I don't know, you say you want to send me an email. Right? So when you send me a, an email, your computer talks to you, your internet service provider then uh, the internet service provider is going to talk to the computer at USC, but not straight. Eh? They, they, they are to, uh, your uh, ISP provider uses a chain of computers to reach the big uh, computer, uh, the big server at USC who takes care of email. Then from the server at USC, it goes, uh, to, uh, when I check my email, it goes to my internet provider, and then from the internet, my internet provider to the computer on my desk here. Right? So you have this whole chain. So for instance, I am here and you are there. And then uh, when we exchange messages, we uh, your message go blop, 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 blop. Where was I said? I, uh, to here. Right? And so you know you you go you have a series of boings to go from my computer to my computer. Here actually the dots are not computers. The dots because the the, the, the way I describe it that would be the whole internet. That's way way too big. So the the backbone just corresponds to the big dot. Namely, I think that my internet service provider 
is probably one dot here and your internet service provider is one dot here and uh, you're not, you and I are not on that picture. Okay, but you know, uh, so there are people whose job is to make sure that information travels well over the internet. And, uh, and the internet is very challenging for electrical engineers because you know electrical engineers have device systems to uh, carry information on networks and um, the, the internet does not, when the internet came up, it didn't fit the usual pattern that engineers were fa familiar with. So there is a, a, a typical use, thing you see is that there are a lot of dots in the graph where, which receive a lot of traffic. And uh, so, of course, some reasons are very simple. Like for instance, uh, clearly the CNN, and the CNN server on election night received a lot of traffic because we were all trying to figure out who's going to win uh, Florida, right? Um, so that's one example. But there are other nodes that are highly congested for reasons which are not apparent. And they, now we begin to understand that there are very subtle reasons for that. So there is a reason, a historic reason for this, which is that the internet was not well thought out. It, it was developed in a relatively anarchic way, namely you, um, people, so you know, it started with a network of five servers uh, somewhere in California, if you remember, uh, and Los Alamos and something in Chicago, if I correctly remember. And then people kept plugging their, net, their, their computers on something that was already connected. And so that was becoming bigger, but uh, uh, the, the plugging in was done always on the outskirts, on the fringes. And so that's more like uh, the building of a tree. Eh? There is a well-known opposite behavior, which is the power grid. So the power grid consists of power plants and uh, cities uh, and uh, power lines going from power, power plants to cities, but also between power plants and between cities. And that one was was very carefully planned by the electrical company. And in particular, they planned it very well so that if one line breaks down, for instance, there is a fire in California, you know, so then when there is a big fire, a whole power line goes down, but that doesn't prevent you from getting your electricity because they can route the electricity in a different way. The power grid is extremely well for that, for that. The internet is not. Eh? That's uh, the point. And uh, so in particular, all these paradigms used by engineers to study large networks, they didn't work very well with the internet. And the reason is because previously they were using like a local picture looking just at uh, for instance, how many nodes, how many, uh, uh, how many uh, so for a given dot, dot you look how many dots are connected to it by an edge. But actually here you need a more global picture. And it turns out that geometric insights borrowed from uh, Riemannian geometry seem better adapted to model the traffic on the internet. In particular, uh, experiments show that the internet seems to be negatively curved. And so I'm going to give you an analogy. And the analogy is going to be pure math. Eh? The analogy, you know, we are in early, no in mid-November, and, uh, you know, there is that thing called Thanksgiving. Um, well, there used to be that thing called Thanksgiving where you could have 16 people sitting around the table. Okay, this year, unfortunately, that doesn't look too good for that. So that in the old days, you would have 16 people sitting at, uh, around the table. There would be a turkey here. And then these people would talk to each other. So for instance, there would be like Uncle Jim here talking to Aunt Susie here. We would have a little chat with Aunt Martha. 
And Martha would also say something to cousin, uh, cousin John and, uh, and, and so on. And, okay, so what I did is that you see the 16 people sitting around the table. And then what all these lines are, are all the conversations going around, namely the exchange of information like on the internet. And what you see on this picture is that the, the traffic, like these lines, is sort of pretty uniform. You see about the same amount of, uh, of lines everywhere. Perhaps not here around the Turkey, but uh, everywhere else, you know, it's pretty uniform. That's because you're using a flat table. Namely, you're having your dinner in a boring living room on a, pla on a plain floor. But how about if your dinner, you have it at a mountain pass with a table that is curved like a mountain near the mountain pass, where it go, mountain pass where it goes up and down in some direction, like, like this. So you remember on at a mountain pass, the curvature is negative, which means that the triangles are skinny. So for instance, if I take these three people, you know, they form a triangle. And because the triangle is skinny, that means that the straight lines, they curve in. So it looks like, the, so the conversation now looks like this. But now let me make the, the mountain pass really steep, namely very curved. So it looks more like this, even more curved, even more curved. And so you see what happens is that when you have a lot of negative curvature, the, the traffic of information, namely the information, goes all through this part here, which is at the center of the table. Okay, so uh, for Thanksgiving, it's really bad because then that means that the turkey is covered with spit, right? Eh? That's not good. Eh? But if you are in charge of uh, dealing with the traffic of the internet, that means that you have an area here which receives the whole uh, traffic on the, the whole exchange of communication of the internet. And, and so that's bad too. And that's exactly the problem that uh, engineers, the kind of problems that engineers are confronted with. Now, of course, this is a purely mathematical model here. Right? So the, uh, they, uh, but uh, there is something very similar which can be observed in experimental data for the actual internet traffic. Uh, so this is work I've done a, a while ago. That was 10 years ago. Right? And so uh, in those days, so there was uh, something called the rocket fuel database, which uh, we looked at. And indeed, what you could observe fitted very well the fact that uh, the uh, so th that the internet seems to have uh, uh, so did I write that somewhere? No, no. Uh, 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 so th there is evidence that the internet behaves like a space where the curvature is negative, and in particular, this approach better fits the actual data than other models. And so the goal was to better, better manage the traffic, namely the supply and demand information uh, on the internet, namely, namely without having log jams. Right? And uh, this is an example where mathematics provides new insight for practical application. But actually that, if I say it like this, it is pretty presumptuous. And that's not the way it works in general, because our nice models from pure mathematics, they never worked exactly right when you want to apply them to the real world. And so you have to, uh, to adapt them. And so you go from the physical world and you adapt them uh, back to the mathematics. And so the way science usually works is you go back and forth between the observation and the theory. So the theory predicts something, you check it on the, in the real data. 
Sometimes it's correct, sometimes it's not correct. So you change the theory and so on, and you keep working. So this is work I've done with my collaborators. I said it was about 10 years ago. Uh, Edmond Jonker at USC is, is a long-term collaborator for this thing. And then we had enrolled uh, Yuli Barishnikov, who was at Bell Labs, and also uh, uh, later at uh, the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. And then later we were also joined by Bashkar Krishnamashari, again at USC, but in the electrical engineering department. Whereas I'm a very, very pure mathematician. Eh? And so we, uh, that was funded by a grant from the NSF uh, from the engineering division uh, of uh, NSF. Okay, so that's all I want to talk to you about. And the purpose of the talk is really to show you that mathematics can be pretty cool, but also so, the, so is engineering. Uh, there was a little bit of physics I presented to you. And I mean, actually the cool thing is that you guys should be interested in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, which is exactly what you're doing, so which is great. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, that's the end of the lecture. If you have any questions, please send them to me in a direct message. I have a few picked out right now, um, but there's still room for more, I, I believe. Um, it's, we have a couple minutes left, so that's what yeah, we're gonna yeah, do. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay, so uh, first question. Can you give like an example of studying in spaces of the fourth dimension if we can't prove that it exists? Oh, the spaces of four dimensions, they do exist. They exist in my head. Eh? Uh, I mean, it's not just my, it's not just my head. So, uh, because I actually, uh, in four, four, it's very easy uh, because you need dimension. So if you travel on a line, the line has one dimension. So when you travel on the line, the, the, the position of my finger on the line, so that's a line, and the position of my finger on the line is determined by a number. Hey, come on. A line, you think of it as the number line, and then a point is determined by a number. When you have a, uh, when you have a point in the plane, you determine by an X coordinate and the Y coordinate, you know that. So that's two numbers. If you have a point in space, uh, uh, that, uh, that's three numbers, uh, and the x, y, and z coordinates, you know that so far. Eh? But, you know, uh, we care about another number, which is time. Eh? So if you, if you want to consider uh, the history of my point, there is a third coordinate, which is called time. And so that's something called space-time, where you have three coordinates, x, y, z, corresponding to uh, uh, the uh, three x, y, z corresponding to the, the space coordinates, but there is a fourth coordinate t for time. Okay? And uh, physics uh, uses uh, uh, that a lot. For instance, I mentioned relativity theory and the general relativity you, uh, that, uh, that lives in a space of dimension four. But then you can go to dimension five. I, I mentioned the example of an airplane, which is controlled by a large number of parameters. You know, you have the position of the airplane, but also you have to take into account whether you tilt this way or that way, or up or down. And actually uh, to control your airplane, you are using a space of dimension, I don't know, uh, say 20 approximately, okay? and, uh, and so on. So uh, large dimensions, uh, you may not be able to draw pictures, but they exist, yes. Okay. Um, Next. All right. What is the reason for comparing curvature to the internet and what does its analysis help us understand? So I, that's what I try to say here, right? So uh, uh, the goal is to better manage the internet. And uh, so you need tools 
something, for instance, um, I said that if you look at the data, you, uh, you find that there, there are these congested areas. And so can you predict where the congestion is going to? Oh, there is another type of graph, by the way, which I forgot to mention. That's the Los Angeles freeways. Eh? <laughs> and again, so here it's not information that travels through the graph, that's uh, cars. Eh? And uh, so again, uh, clearly it's a problem that civil engineers can be interested in, but it's a problem of uh, traffic on a graph, so it's very similar. And uh, clearly in Los Angeles, we know that it's really important to avoid traffic jams. And, you know, and when you create a freeway, when you build new freeways, it's, there is this well-known phenomenon that sometimes when you build an additional freeway, the traffic jams increase instead of decreasing. And that's because, um, so, uh, now people beginning, are beginning to understand this a little better, and it's a kind of problems that people want to attack. And uh, you need the techniques, and mathematics can provide some techniques. Like for the freeway, it's also important to have sensors. Eh? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Was that a good answer? Yeah, that's a good answer. Okay. Um, I, I think we can do one more. This will be a bit of a simpler one, um, just to close it. So what advice would you give to high school students who want to start researching this area of STEM? Uh, I, I don't think there is anything very approachable for you guys at this point. But uh, you can look it up. Um, and try, uh, I don't know of any good resource. So let, me be, let me be honest. I think the best thing you can do is take a lot of classes. But okay, you knew that, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you want to, when you go to, uh, so I assume that uh, you all want to go to college eventually. And uh, when you go to college, the more math and science classes you have taken, the better uh, prepared you will be. And then you will, you will be able to take even more advanced math and classes in, uh, in, in college. So uh, do that. And, be interested on the site, uh, like your blog is, the, the, like the blog posts on your website are pretty great, I thought. Yeah, for instance, yeah.